And today's scripture reading lends itself very well to a two-reader uh, format. So please welcome up Brad and Micah Wills. Our scripture this morning is from Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 7 through chapter 12, verse 8. Go take it away, young person. Light is sweet. How pleasant to see a new day dawning. When people live to be very old, let them rejoice in every day of life. But let them also remember there will be many dark days. Everything still to come is meaningless. Young people, it's wonderful to be young. Enjoy every minute of it. Do everything you want to do and take it all in. But remember, you must give an account to God to everything you do. So refuse to worry, keep your body healthy, but remember that youth, with your whole life before you, is meaningless. Don't let the excitement of youth cause you to forget your Creator. Honor Him in your youth before you grow old and say, life is not pleasant anymore. Remember Him before the light of the sun, the moon, and the stars is dim to your old eyes, and rain clouds continually darken your skies. Remember him before your legs, the guards of your house, start to tremble, and before your shoulders, the strong men stoop. Remember him before your teeth, your few remaining servants, stop grinding, and before your eyes, the woman, woman looking through the windows see dimly. Remember him before the door of life's opportunities is closed and the sound of work fades. Now <laughs> you rise at the first chirping of birds, not but then all their sounds will grow faint. Remember him before you become fearful of falling and worry about danger in the streets, before your hair turns white like an almond tree in bloom, and you drag along without energy like a dying grasshopper, and the capperberry no longer inspires sexual desire. Hey. <laughs> Remember him before you near the grave, your everlasting home, when the mourners will weep at your funeral. Yes, remember your creator now while you were young, before the silver cord of life snaps and the golden bowl is broken. Don't wait until the water jar is smashed at the spring and the pulley is broken at the well. From then, dust will return to the earth and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Everything, Everything is, is meaningless, meaningless, says, says the, the teacher. teacher. Completely, Completely meaningless. Uh, you guys did a super job with that. And uh, as Pastor Dan said, I think that one does lend itself to that uh, dual back and forth. So um, we, uh, we enjoyed that. Um, I do have to say that as I look out, and you know lots of people got their Hawaii shirts on, right? This is probably one of our most colorful Sundays of the year, okay? So we want to thank you for being a part of that. And I know there are always some contrarians. You know the contrarians who say, I know. It's Hawaiian Shirt Sunday, so I am not going to wear a Hawaiian shirt. I'll wear it some other Sunday. And, of course, we always make room for that at KCC. Uh, but what we're really trying to do, we're, by the way, if you're here for the first time, we are not a cult, okay? This doesn't happen every Sunday, okay? Uh, but, you know, most of us at one time or another went to a tropical climate, okay? And we decided to bring something back with us. And, oh, man, it seemed like such a great purchase while we were there, then we got it back and we looked at it in our closet and said, when am I ever going to wear that, you know? And uh, so we're just trying to help you justify that purchase, okay, by giving you an opportunity to wear whatever it was that you bought when you were in Hawaii or another tropical place. Well, it's good to be back with you. Uh, my study and planning leave for 2015 is now in the rearview mirror. I got the opportunity to um, do some careful, in-depth planning for the upcoming year, and I'll be telling you more about how I think God spoke to me and what some of the things are that we'll be doing. But the big thing I want to do this morning is just say thank you to the congregation and to the leaders of the congregation for, again, making this a priority for me so I can get out in front of things. Um, I know that when I do this, I'm like the you know, the kid whose um, eyes are bigger than his appetite, you know what I mean? I've got all these lofty goals for everything I'm going to accomplish, 
And, uh, you know, then a few things come up that need me to attend to them, and I just don't get everything done that I thought I would. I think that's been the case every year I've done this. However, I'm not telling you it was all a loss. Actually, I got some really great planning done, and I am very excited about the things that we'll be doing uh, starting this fall, and I'll have a chance to tell you more about that in the weeks to come. Um, In view of everything that's happening, and, uh, you know, this happens to me every year, but Now that we have made the turn into August, I start to get really focused on getting all the fall ministry started around here. And it's a big, huge gear up because things that have sort of taken a rest for the summer are going to come back, you know, full speed in the fall. And lots of people do their vacations in the summer and they do traveling. And, you know, so we don't always have a big, huge turnout. But, you know, once school starts, people kind of start to drift back in and, Um, we're we're all excited and getting ready for another year. So I decided I'm going to wrap up the uh, Book of Ecclesiastes series today. We'll take a look at what's in chapter 11 and some of what's in chapter 12. It was going to have one more message, but I'm going to wrap it up today. And then next Sunday, I'm starting a new series to help get us ready for the fall. And that one is called Serving a Heart Condition. And we're going to take a look at why it is that as followers of Christ, we have this deep yearning to serve God in some significant place in His kingdom. And we're going to discover that this is really a part of how God built us, and we really can't experience the deepest joys in life the way God built us until we find our place of service in the work of His kingdom. And some of those opportunities come to us through our local church. So we're going to have a a focus on some of the great ministries that go on here, just like we did with worship and arts this morning. So I'm looking forward to uh, getting that started. Today we want to sink our teeth into uh, these last couple of chapters of Ecclesiastes. I do want to say thank you to those who filled in for me the last few weeks since I last preached, both Mary Hendrickson and Sarah Butler Wills did a fantastic job. Honestly, I heard all kinds of great things about their messages, so my thanks to you for being willing to be a part of this series. None of these passages we've been working with are easy, and uh, you have, you know, heard the one for this morning read, and um, certainly, you know, probably not the most upbeat experience you've ever heard. Although people who sit over in this section, the young people, they they didn't bother them any. You know, it's just the rest of us that felt impacted by what it had to say. But you know, those themes that have been so prominent in this letter, themes like the meaninglessness of life. Did you hear anything about that in today's reading? How about this one, pessimism about the future? Did you hear anything about that? And how about this other one, cynicism, you know, about some of life's just basic experiences, the things that all of us go through. Those are some of the themes we've been working with in this book. The big caveat today is that the teacher tells us it really stinks to get older. That's what he has to say. As if we didn't already know that. He spells it out in great detail, in technicolor, everything that can go wrong with your body. And you know the teacher by now, if it can go wrong, it will go wrong, and he wants to talk about it. Because of that, he's got some advice for those who are young. Now, you all know that in this book, this series, we've had to kind of test some of the things the teacher has to say with what is taught in other passages of Scripture, because we can't just take it all at face value, okay? Uh, Some of what's in Ecclesiastes is a lot like the speeches of Job's friends in the book of Job. You know that they meant well. You know that they were trying to encourage their friend. They were trying to help their friend. But we find out at the end of the book that some of what they had to say wasn't actually true. Okay, so we always want to test what we read here with other passages of Scripture to make sure it stands up to the test of the gospel. The teacher likes to live in this dichotomy, in this tension. He likes to talk about the meaninglessness of life, and 
He talks about it as if God didn't exist or God didn't care what happens here. And you know, when he wants to talk about that, he's, what's that phrase he uses? Under the sun. Here's what life is like under the sun, okay? And then at other times, he makes references to God and heaven. And, you know, this is what happens when God is in our lives. And it's a completely different perspective. Well, here's what I want us to see. As he moves toward his sign-up, sign-off, wrapping up this book, the teacher wants to bring home to us some truth about God and wants to bring us home to God. I thought as I studied this passage, you know, there are really two different ways you could interpret this. And they show us this tension that we've been living in with Kohelet, the teacher. On the one hand, we might conclude from this passage, life is hard and then we die. Okay, you've heard that before. I almost gave that the title, made that the title for my message this morning. Life is hard and then we die. However, at the same time, there's another dominant theme here. And it is a call to live for God starting when we're young and lasting throughout our lives until we're ready to draw our last breath. And he mixes those themes with each other. But it's that latter one that's the more important and the one that we want to focus on this morning. He has two observations I want to call attention to. First, he says, especially to the young, enjoy life while you are young. It's part of his message. Now, that's the bright side. Enjoy life while you're young. You know how the teacher speaks. There's always a dark side too, isn't there? Here's the dark side. Enjoy life while you're young because the day is coming when you will be old and decrepit and you won't be able to enjoy life anymore. Isn't that a happy message? Aren't you glad you came to church this morning to hear that? Here's where I want to start. Do me a favor, raise your hand if you're old. If you're old, raise your hand. Raise your, come on, raise them high. Let's see those hands go up. All right. Now, Pastor Dan does not have his hand up. Do you think that's right? No, me either. All right, here's what I'm going to do. Some of you are brave enough to uh, raise your hands. Thank you. Uh, you're the ones who are not in denial. Congratulations, okay? Pastor Dan has a microphone. Uh, I'm going to ask a few of you who raised your hands a few minutes ago if you would just stand and give your wisdom to the next generation. By that I mean just something you would like to pass along about life can be spiritual, can be practical, pragmatic, whatever. But you know, what little bit of wisdom would you pass on to just a sentence, to, uh, to people who are, say, 30 and un younger, okay? All right, now, raise your hands again. Who's willing to do this? Got to have volunteers, okay? Raise your hand. Come on, those of you who had your hands up, here we go. Here's one right here. I don't know if she qualifies as old, but Maylene, thank you. I'm old. I have children, therefore I'm older than they are. Okay. Um, I, my advice would be pay cash for everything, finance nothing. All right, pay cash for everything. Don't borrow money. Basically. Okay, good. What else? My advice comes from Proverbs 3, 5, 6, and 7, that if we're really going to live life with meaning, we have to trust the Lord with all of our heart. We've gotten a lot of advice from the world. It's mostly bad. But then when, when we get to verse 7, it says, um, don't be wise in your own eyes. And one of the things that I found is when you get older, uh, sometimes you think, I've learned it now. And I have to go back to verse, <laughs> the first verse that says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And I'll tell you, when you do, life is really worth living. Amen. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He will make your path straight. And what else I heard in that, Mr. Wiesner, was keep learning your whole life because there's always new things to learn. Great. Somebody else. I don't know. We got to have this side represent Pastor Dan. Plus, we want to see how fast you can run over here. All right. 
We don't want you to be like that grasshopper in the scripture we read this morning, okay? Somebody over here, raise your hand. You're willing, come on. We've got a volunteer. I see one. Ron is going to share with us real quick. I'd say, number one, put your faith in God. Uh, number two, if you're young, is save money, get a good job, and save your money. Because when you get old, it goes fast. Amen. Put your faith in God and save money while you're young. Okay, I, I think that's enough. We just needed to kind of get a smattering and, and get a perspective on what people have to say, okay? So we're just kind of setting up the fact that the teacher, Kohelet, has a few things to say to the younger generation. Uh, take a look with me at verses 9 through 12, okay? You heard that read this morning. I'm not going to read them again, but you'll notice uh, starting there at verse 9, it's on the screen in front of you. What is the teacher saying? Isn't he saying young people, and I don't know for sure, you know, where you put that threshold, what the magic age is that makes you young. I think in our culture, it's kind of a moving target. And wouldn't we all say that, you know, not everybody ages at the same rate, okay? Now, if you're here for the first time today, maybe you don't know me, you look up here, you see me, you say to yourself, man, that guy's about 35 years old, right? <laughs> no? That's not what you say? We got to turn the lights down a little bit more, okay? We're trying to get that effect, all right? Uh, the fact is, we all, well, I don't know, maybe not all, but most of us live in some denial about aging, all right? We don't really like to talk about it, and we don't like to think about it, and we don't like to believe we're really getting old. Um, and then sometimes things happen that, you know, just kind of shock us a little bit, and we have to face up to it, and, you know, sometimes people get offended, if you sound like you're talking about them as being old or, you know, if you're asking them what their age is. This whole thing kind of hit me like a ton of bricks. A number of years ago, uh, I was at the local Burger King on Benson ordering some food. I think I ordered a Whopper or something like that, and she didn't charge me enough. And so I spoke up and I said, uh, Miss, I think I owe you a little bit more money. You didn't charge me enough. And she said, oh, no, I gave you the senior discount. <laughs> I was shocked. I was stunned. I was speechless for a second. And I said, well, well I didn't ask for the senior discount. She said, well, you know, I just thought you'd appreciate it. You look like you qualify. <laughs> and I said, uh, well, well, you know, at what age does that kick in? And she said, 55. And I think I was about 57 at the time. And I thought, how do these people know these things? Is it like tattooed on my forehead what my age is? I mean, I didn't show my driver's license or anything like that. It was a sobering moment for me. I haven't gone back there very many times either. <laughs> you know? Don't give me the senior discount unless I ask for it. And honestly... For a lot of years, up until maybe two years ago, I refused to ever ask for the senior discount, okay? We go to a movie, they have the senior's price. I say to my wife, no, we're paying full price. It's not worth the $2 to me, the assault on my ego, okay? We're not doing that senior thing, all right? So a lot of us are, are in denial. But uh, let's just say the teacher puts it at maybe age 30. That's everybody who's young. Okay, listen to what he says. Basically, he says, do everything you want to do while you are young. Do as much of your bucket list as you can when you're young because the day is coming when you won't be able to do it anymore. Now, he's quick to put some boundaries on it. He's not saying, you know, drugs or sex or a partying lifestyle. He's like the Apostle Paul talking about all the freedom we have in Christ, you know, in the book of Romans and Galatians, but he always follows it up by saying, but I'm not talking about license to sin. That's not what this passage is about. So the teacher says, but remember that you must give an account to God for everything you do. 
his point is. And I think many of us would agree, not really a spiritual point, but one of those practical points about life. His point is, if there's something you really want to do and it requires some physical strength and energy, do it while you're young. If you want to run in a marathon, do it while you're young because a day will come when you can't do it anymore. If you want to climb a mountain, do that when you're young because the day will come when you can't do it anymore. If you want to travel, see the world, do that when you're young because the day will come when you can't do it anymore. If you want to join the Peace Corps, do that when you're young. The day will come when they don't even want you anymore. All right, write this down. When we're young, life has a way of opening all kinds of doors of opportunity before us. As we age, life starts to close down those same doors of opportunity. I'm not saying everything closes down, and I'm not saying there aren't some new opportunities that open up. This is just an axiom about life that's generally true. As we get older and older, the number of doors of opportunity that were there for us when we were young start to close down. Then he moves on in verse 10 and he says, so refuse to worry. I'm, I'm not sure worry is the best way to translate that. It's a word in Hebrew actually often means anger. Don't get angry. Or here's an even better word for it, resentment. I think that's probably the best translation. Don't let resentment get a hold of you. Because folks, isn't it true when resentment takes up residence in our lives, it has a long shelf life, doesn't it? It's dangerous. It changes our souls. You know, you can be angry about something and that can pass and a week later you don't even remember what you were mad about. Oh, but with resentment, that takes a hold of our soul and it changes us. So he's saying, you know, don't let resentment get a hold of you. And then he says, keep your body healthy. And by that, he's really not talking about going to the gym four or five times a week. Maybe that's what we think about. Healthy here in Hebrew really means keep your body free from aches and pains. Do everything you can. And he may even be linking those ideas together. I kind of think he is. That mind-body connection. You know, because when something like resentment gets a hold of you and takes up residence in your soul, pretty soon it starts to show up in your body. And you struggle with illnesses and you feel more aches and pains than you otherwise would. It just kind of casts a shadow over everything. The real zinger comes at the end of the verse. But remember that your life is meaningless anyway. Isn't that a happy note? You notice with the teacher, he can't just leave a positive statement alone. He can't just say, you know, young people, live it up, do all the things you want to do while you're young. He can't just leave it there. He's got to balance it with a corresponding negative statement. Your life is meaningless anyway. He's laying the foundation for what he's going to say next. Here's the second one. Honor God as you age. I think I have that written just a little bit different way in the notes. It goes like this on your sermon outline. Honor God all the way to your death. That's going to be the theme. I'll tell you what we're going to do. I don't know why, but this is starting to make noise. We've always got... We'll just... I can't holler anymore the way I used to be able to. Honor God as you age. Oh, but this comes from the teacher, so there's got to be a dark side. Here's the dark side. Because you are on an inexorable path toward death. Now, I know inexorable is a big word, isn't it? See, once in a while I like to throw big words at you. What does it mean, inexorable? Pastor Dan, I don't see him here. You know, he's like our walking dictionary. If we ever don't know what a word means, we ask him. And he usually knows. And if he doesn't know, he fakes it like he does and leads us all astray. 
Inexorable means unyielding, means it is going to happen. There is nothing you can do to stop it. You are on your way to death. It started the moment you were born. It's a mortal life that we have in the here and now, folks. Unless you are one of the fortunate ones, one of the blessed ones to be alive walking this earth when the Lord Jesus returns, get this, you will die. That's going to happen. And given that fact, and this is where the teacher's underlying faith comes to the surface, he says... Live for God. Start early in life and stay late all the way to your last breath. And then he starts into this morbid description of what happens to our bodies as we're on this journey towards death. And he does it with poetic poignancy. And a lot of what is said here is in metaphors and figures of speech And some of them, we don't even know how to translate because they're not figures of speech that we still use. So, you know, the scholars are doing a lot of guessing. Some of them are clear, but others are not. There's a few of them we still use. but A lot of them we don't. So maybe in your translation, we read from the New Living Translation. That is a translation. It's not a paraphrase. But maybe, you know, if you have King James or NIV or NASB or something, you know, you say... I don't even know what part of this he's in. It's just a totally different sentence. This is why. Because some of these things are very hard to interpret and understand precisely. But look at chapter 12, starting with verse 1. I'm not going to read all of these, but I just want you to look at them. They're in your sermon notes, okay? They're on that outline. And this is kind of a continuation from verse 9. Throughout this passage, he's really calling people to elevate their commitment to God. To us, the word remember can mean a lot of things. We can use that in a lot of different uh, contexts, connotations. You know, usually it's just kind of a reflection. When we say, you know, remember something, we can see a sight, hear a sound, smell a fragrance, and suddenly, you know, we're remembering something. We've made these associations in our mind, okay? Okay. And we say we have good memories and bad memories. And you know the good memories, we kind of like to linger over those, don't we? And the bad memories, maybe we do our best to sort of push them out of our minds and not spend too much time there. But mostly memory for us is like a, a reflection, okay? I can say, I remember when the Mariners won 116 games in a season. I was actually 2001. I said it was 1995 in the earlier service. Somebody corrected me. But I remember the 1995 season. It was the first time the Mariners got into postseason, the playoffs. Remember those years? Weren't those fantastic? Weren't those great? It was awesome. Here's the problem with that kind of memory. It has absolutely no impact whatsoever on the present. And case in point, the game yesterday that the Mariners played, okay? We're not the same Mariners. All right. Uh, I will say this, though. The um, ceremony for the induction of Jamie Moyer into the Mariners Hall of Fame, that was powerful. That was meaningful. If you get a chance, you know, if it's recorded somewhere, you ought to see that and hear everything that was said. It was outstanding. And we had to suffer through the game. Eleven innings. I'm not going any further with that. To the Hebrews, the word remember meant making it happen again, living in that same reality now. To remember God was to recommit your life to Him. Remember God, folks, is still a call to loyalty and faithfulness in knowing and serving God. And the teacher says the right time for that to start is when you are young. And then that can carry you through all the troubles and trials and travails of getting older. And as you look at the end of chapter, uh, verse 1 and on into verse 2, I, I think what he's saying here is pretty self-explanatory. He really is talking about what happens when we you know, lose our eyesight. 
One of the challenges of getting older, the eyesight's not everything it used to be, and the world starts to look dim, and we're fortunate, you know, over the ages we've learned there are things you can do about that. Nobody in the biblical times wore glasses or contact lenses or anything like that. And there are eye ailments that take away our sight, and maybe we can slow them down, but we can't stop them altogether. Things like macular degeneration. Verse 3 is a reference to our legs. Remember, folks, your legs are your mobility. And the word house here is really a reference to our bodies, to our whole bodies. How well can you defend yourself, even if it means running away, if your legs are trembling, if your legs can barely keep you up, if your legs are not working very well? And shoulders, as you know, are a metaphor for physical work. You know, we talk about somebody with strong shoulders. They can lift heavy burdens and carry them, but then that day comes when we can't lift so much anymore. And maybe even our shoulders start to stoop. Remember him before your teeth stop grinding. See, when all of your teeth fall out, it's pretty hard to eat, isn't it? Now, we have some ways to overcome that. You know, we have dentures and we have implants, and tell me about it. I got a couple of implants in my own mouth that our teeth do wear out. And before your eyes, and this is an interesting little metaphor, the women looking through the windows see dimly. The women of wealth and leisure would often have great big windows put in their homes so they could spend hours each day looking out on what was happening on the estate and watching the workers and watching what was going on. And so that just became kind of a figure of speech for your eyes, being able to look out on the world and see what's happening and being able to, to watch and to stare if you want to. Verse 4, the day comes when you can't work anymore. You're not talking about voluntary retirement. In biblical times, people worked until their bodies could not sustain them anymore. And he says, and that day comes when you can't even get up early in the morning and you're not able to hear the early morning birds chirping away. So many times, especially in the summer when my wife and I in our upstairs bedroom you know, sleep with the window open, one of the first sounds I hear, and I know that day is breaking as the birds start chirping. He says the day comes when you can't even hear them anymore, and you can't get up and work. And, you know, in the biblical world, the climate, they love to get up early, early, early and get their work done before the worst of the heat of the day. Verse 5, as we age, falling becomes a greater risk, doesn't it? When you're a child and you fall, what do you do? You just get up and you dust yourself off and you keep going. I get the biggest kick out of little kids around here. You know, the toddlers, three, four, five years old. I see them running around and you kind of wish they wouldn't run, but they love to run. That's part of that age. And then pretty soon they do a face plant. And what do they do? They just jump up and keep going. It doesn't slow them down at all. Uh, But when you're older... Part of the challenge is you got to stay on your feet. Because what happens when you fall? You break bones. Sometimes, and, and this, you know, happens, we know this. This fall, break a hip or something like that, well, it really becomes the precipitating event to this old and sort of frail person for their death, right? They go to the hospital and, you know, they get the hip taken care of, but while they're there, they get pneumonia or something. And that takes their life. So we, we know the challenge as we age is to stay on our feet. And he says our hair changes color as we age. Maybe it goes from dark to gray to white. I was with somebody this last week who said, I started shaving my head when my hair all came in white. Now, I want to say this. I am thankful that the teacher didn't say anything about losing your hair altogether, okay? That happens too, doesn't it? But isn't it true? Only to the most intelligent of people, right? They're the ones who lose their hair. 
And then he says, you drag along without energy like a dying grasshopper. I don't know that I've ever seen this, okay? But it's a poignant, poetic image, isn't it? You know, you're just dragging along, shuffling maybe. You don't have much energy. It's hard to get from one place to the next. Everybody who has preached in this series has gotten at least one doozy of a verse to work with, and this is mine. Take a look at it here. It's all a part of what's in verse 5. He says, and the caperberry no longer inspires sexual desire. Okay, well, the caperberry, I think we got a picture there. It is, was an aphrodisiac in the ancient world. And he's just saying, hey, even the caperberry won't help you. And you notice that comes right before he talks about the grave. You're close to death is what he's saying when this happens. But throughout this, he says, remember him. You know, that call, stay committed, renew your commitment. And in the way he says this, remember him before you near the grave, your everlasting home, when the mourners will weep your funeral. Well, the teacher is not talking about eternal life, and he's certainly not talking about a resurrection life, is he? He's just talking about the grave as if that were it. But of course, he lived before the time of Jesus before Jesus in his resurrection burst through, you know, uh, to a new life and made it possible for all of us to rise to a new life if we put our trust in him. And then in these last couple of verses in our text today, introduces some metaphors. And you know, really the scholars don't even know what he means by all of these. I read four scholars this week, Bible commentators, every one of them disagreed. So I thought, well, I'm not going to stand up there and tell people this is what it means when they can't even agree on it. This is poetry. When the silver cord of life snaps and the golden bowl is broken and the water jar is smashed at the spring and the pulley broken, at the well. You can use your imagination about what that means, but I think we all get the point. It's a picture of death and dying, the complete demise of our bodies so that we can no longer live. It's that stage many pass through, not everybody, where just nothing, nothing works anymore. And then he caps it all off by saying, for then the dust will return to the earth and the spirit will return to God who gave it. And he does have a sense of reverence for life, doesn't he? Because he remembers from the book of Genesis. We came from dust, didn't we? God scooped up the dust and made the first human being. And then what did he do? He said, well, you're not going to just be physical creatures. He breathed the Spirit into us. The Spirit came from God. And the teacher says at that point, it goes back to God. And then he says, and it's the statement that we've grown accustomed to in this book. You never get too far away from it. Verse 8, everything is meaningless, completely meaningless. It's his assessment of life on this earth. However, the book doesn't end there, does it? Will you jump over with me to those last couple of verses? Verse 13 and verse 14. They're uh, written out in your notes there. I'm going to read that. Listen to this, starting at verse 13. That's the whole story. Here now is my final conclusion. Fear God and obey His commands, for this is everyone's duty. God will judge us for everything we do, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. Fear God means reverence God. Obey His commands, for this is everyone's duty. And then he goes on to talk about judgment day, doesn't he? When we stand before God and everything is unveiled, Jesus talked about this too in the Gospel of Luke. Luke recorded Jesus saying this, time is coming when everything that is covered up will be revealed. And all that is secret will be made known to all. 
Whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light, and whatever you have whispered behind closed doors will be shouted from the housetops for all to hear. That's judgment day. Everything is laid bare. Everything about our lives. But here's the good news. We don't have to worry about that. We don't have to worry about it no matter how tough, how bad life may get if we will follow this part of the teacher's message, which is summarized, live for God, start early, and stay late. Live for God. That's the call of this passage. Start early and stay late. Amen? Amen. That concludes our work in the book of Ecclesiastes. Let's pray together. God, this has been a challenging study for all of us. Sometimes these words of the teacher are such a downer. And there have been many times when we're just confounded, confused. But there are those moments when the teacher breaks through all the clutter of life, calls us back to you, and gives us, even if it's just a glimpse, a look at your greatness and your power and your glory. And a reminder that if we do not live for you, if we leave you out of the picture, life really is meaningless when it's all said and done. What a hard thing that would be to discover at the end of a long life when we stand before you instead of hearing the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. If we were to hear those words, I never knew you. And be cast then, as Jesus said, into the outer darkness. God, remind us how important it is to find our meaning in you, for you are our creator. You made us physical, and you made us spiritual. You breathed your life into us. You breathed your spirit into us. And it's spirit to spirit in our relationship with you that we find that meaning. And you sent your son, your only son, Jesus, to say, come home with me. Come home to the God who loves you and who has never, for one moment or one day, given up on you. The God who's been seeking and searching and looking for you. That Jesus that Son of the Most High, exalted, Almighty God, who even laid down His life for us. And then by Your power, O God Almighty, took it up again to show us the wonders of the life that awaits if we put our trust in You, if we live for You. We thank You and we give You praise. In Jesus' name, amen.